Hello, and thanks for joining us on this week's podcast. Um, it's podcast number four. How the hell we managed to get this far in, I've no idea. Um, we had a couple of special guests on last week, and they're already fixtures. So it's the same crew as usual, plus the extra value of Mally Davies and Mr. James R. Burns. Uh, just just mix in a, a, a nice bit of round of applause there, Gary, if you would. Thank you very much. I yeah. clapped. I was, there. I was there with the old round of applause. I didn't hear it. Did you hear that, Mel? I didn't hear that. No, I didn't hear that. Yeah. Yeah. We're going round on different people's channels. This week, uh, it's on my channel, apparently. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, sorry about that to any of my subscribers that get this rubbish in your inbox. Um, we tend to start with a couple of regular features, and we're going to start this week uh, with what are we all drinking? So... Let's, I'm, I'm on Bishop's finger because, unfortunately, the Purple Moose Brewery has shut down for the duration, I found oh. out. Um, and I sincerely hope that they are able to restart production in due course because it is a rather magnificent brewery. Right, uh, next. Mally, what are you drinking? Well, I've been insulted from the last uh, podcast by many people for drinking what they say is a, a soft ass's drink, Strongbow. <laughs> But I'll go tip to toe with anyone who can keep up with me on this stuff. There'll not be many. <laughs> do you hear me, Gary? Do you hear me? You Mate, the, the last time I drank Strongbow, no, no word of a lie, I was 15. <laughs> Just going to say that. <laughs> well, look, was, at, look at the complexion. That was snake bite, wasn't it, Gary? Yeah, I'm only actually 23 now. I'm still on it. No, I was I was 15 and I was, uh, I think, I think uh, Pump Up The Jam was in the charts oh, at the time. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I was so ill, I was so ill that um, I had to be escorted home by a policewoman um, from a night. Yeah, that was was great. That's what you said, policewoman. She was actually a stripper. (laughs) No, trust me, mate. She was definitely a policewoman. So, yeah. So that that cider mm. started, David. Are you ready for this? With a, a, it it used to be the 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 choice of the youth was Merry Down. We'll all know a bit about that. I used to drink Merry Down. Thunderbirds. Do you remember oh, that? Oh, rough. Ooh. Ooh. Mad Dog 2020. Yeah. Well, oh, as yeah. I mentioned about having a bit of old Rosie last week, I tried to get some again, but in lockdown, she's been tucked away at cupboard, so I've no chance. What are you drinking, Jamie? Well, I'm drinking. Well, I'm, st- I'm carrying on with my normal starter of Ghost Ship. Um, but then, you know, respecting the, uh, the brew dog, Brewery's decision to oh, it's disappearing oh. into the background, isn't Whoa. it? So I'll put it in front of green me screen fail. Um, it's a complete green <laughs> screen. Uh, but just <laughs> their decision to change their uh, distillery to hand sanitizer, I thought I'd well, I hope this doesn't taste like hand sanitizer, but I thought I'd go with that. And then in their range, I spotted a a Brewdog Quench Quake, which is grapefruit and tangerine sour. <laughs> Oh, so I've got no idea that I'll even get onto that. You're you're not selling that at all, mate. This is not a proper pub, is it? I mean, <laughs> no pub sells that sort of rubbish. Not any pub that I've been into, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. You go and ask for that in a pub round here, you get a slap in the face. <laughs> so, James, are you are you still on the tea? So I'm uh, keeping to traditional tea. Uh, one tea. It's actually not Yorkshire tea. I do confess. Ooh. Run out. Of that. So it's actually. Oh, I don't like Tetley's. Tetley's and PG. Nice bit of twinings. It's oh, I'll get you, Mr. Posh. Twinings? Uh, twinings. Oh, Dan, you're not that posh. Oh, seriously, twinings, English breakfast, a little bit of milk. Oh, lovely cup of tea, that. M- moving on then, uh, what we next do is... Whoa, a whoa, whoa, hang on, whoa, hang on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Hang on. Oh, oh, hang on. Not, not, not let's move on. You didn't ask me. Or me. I assumed you were on the Carlsberg. Exactly. That's why we're not going to move on. Now, no, this week, no. because of the amount of grief that I got, and I come bottom of the lager <laughs> choice on Pubcast 2, and then I got some grief, I think, on 3, this week I'm actually on my favourite drink, which is Guinness. Oh. Uh, now, if I was on a, a desert island... Redeemed. If I was on a desert island and I didn't care anymore, I would take nothing but Guinness with me. That would be my drink of choice, but it is a little bit heavy to drink all It is bit heavy, yeah. Yeah, mm. but I love it. And you know about it, don't you, the following day? Yeah. No, 
it, it doesn't affect me at all. Is it not? Is. No, no. I can drink quite a lot mm. of Guinness. No headache, no nothing. But it's just quite a heavy drink. But yeah, lager does affect me. The, the following day, if I had Guinness, it's Poopsville. All day Aww. for me. <laughs> not silent and not, not very violent. Yeah, no. I think for completeness, we need to get Gary's choice. So we yeah. get proper yeah, Gary. Gary. We haven't done no, Gary. I'm just on them. I'm still on some of this because I've got it left over. Is that from last week? Yeah, from oh, last week. Oh, yeah. Drink it. Yeah, and oh, I did get some Biera Moretti in as well, but uh, I'm not drinking right. that just yet. So, yeah, boring. I'll be, I'll be last this week, Darren. Well done. Cheers for that, mate. Excellent. <laughs> well, votes, votes below. Yeah. Good choice. Good choice. Um, yeah, I, I haven't seen any figures on last week, so I can't can't add anything there. So um, what we do have on last week's, though, is our regular five thumbs downs, for which thank you very much indeed, yeah. whoever you are. Um, we would really like to emulate that this week if we could. Or we'll uh, beat it. But only five. Oh, we want to beat it, do we? Okay, mm-hmm. six. Can we have six thumbs downs, please? Yeah. So it's interesting, the five, because I can actually, actually know the five are. <laughs> it's a secret, and I'll let you know. It's related to the um, IPL address, IPS address. What, what is it? The IP address. IP address. Yeah. It's interesting. I'll let you know. No, it's a I, secret think, word. I think <laughs> the reason that this has been mentioned is only following on from what Gary actually said about when I, th- I don't. I don't think it was last week. I think it might have been the week before when. Um, J- Jamie got some dislikes on his video, and Gary very poetically said, "Yeah, that's because they don't like the video. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with you. They just don't like the video." And yeah. Gary said that he gets some instant dislikes as soon as the video drops. And so the reason we were saying this, it's quite spooky that we've done three podcasts or podcasts up until this one, and each video has got five dislikes. No, no, more, no less an even number of five per per video yeah well this one's going out on my channel so five dislikes will be pretty good <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah anyway the next thing of course on our regular agenda before we get to the general chit chat is um comments from last week uh and as ever, we welcome your comments, folks. So, you know, write in, tell us what you think. Um, but the, I'm actually going to focus this week on photography comments because we had lots of very kind feedback where people said they liked the show. So thank you very much indeed. Um, but let's talk about photography. Um, Neil Matheson wrote in, and we'd been talking about, because of the lockdown, we have to really work our local area. And Neil Matheson said he gets bored with local areas and he'd much prefer to explore somewhere new. Um, it helps with the creativity. Um, so I suppose, Neil, you've got a point, but it's also fair to say you have to be double creative. You're shooting the same bloody tree <laughs> weeks on end. Um, so thanks for that, Neil. That's a good observation. Alan Cole says I'm not on his Christmas list anymore. Well, Alan, thanks a lot, mate. Uh, <laughs> that means you're just getting one then this year. Yeah, that's a yeah from myself. Yeah, and Mrs. G. No, she doesn't send me one. <laughs> Sends me one. Anyway, so. <laughs> uh, <feeds> with Ian. <laughs> uh, Ian Mack wrote in. I don't know. Uh, Mac, Muck, just Muck. Uh, well, and Ian, he said, Ian, we know Ian, yeah. Sorry, yeah, Ian. he said, Mally's right about work in the area. Stop banging on about how dull the east of England is. That, yeah. That's aimed at me. Me and, me and, and me. go backwards and forwards. Yeah, the mourners. Yeah, same with the mourners. Subject. Yeah. Do you have any idea how far I'd have to drive to get a field of poppies or a nice clean horizon? It's just the grass is always greener elsewhere. When the light is pants in the mountains, it may be dappled in the forests or misty in the fens. I sit in the back garden and look at the mountains, dreaming of flat light, a windmill, and a sturdy coal shed by a slow-moving river. That's very well written, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, it's impressive, it. isn't it? Mm. Exactly. But he sort of makes a point that there's stuff to be seen wherever you happen to be. You, you've just got to see it. Yeah. Where does he live? Where does he live? Remind me. It doesn't say. I don't know. I know where he lives. He lives in Scotland, the jammy git. So, <laughs> so it's all, right, all very well him turning around and saying, oh, yeah, you know, I'd love the, love the field of poppies. Well, I'd love to live in Scotland, mate. So <laughs> I'm going to continue moaning with the greatest of respect. I do like him, actually. He's a good lover. Yeah, I'm going to continue moaning about where I live. And if you, you know, we should always do a little house swap. I can come and live in your little cottage. 
by all the mountains and then I'll moan about not having any puppies. That'd be great. And do you know what? I'm quite pleased actually that, that this subject's been brought up because I was actually thinking about this today. And I, I was when I was listening to last week's podcast and we were just talking about shooting local and James, you know, you kind of made some, some good points about the, the silver birch trees. You know, getting you get different, yeah, getting different cross. options, yeah. But I, what I wish I would have said actually on on the on the uh, the last episode is, I think us as photographers to get good shots, we have to be inspired. So even though that you're hundred percent correct, and you, yeah. Mally, you was make put in a good case, if you're not inspired by that kind of surroundings, then you could get all the shots in the world, but you're not going to put your heart into it, don't you? Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. If you're not interested in the type of photography you make, I think if you go into an, a location with expectation, and they, and you be, you come out disappointed if you don't if you don't get that expectation, if you know what I mean. Yeah. There's the other point as well, Darren and and, and James about having a vision, having a preconceived yeah, expectation idea. vision. Yeah. yeah if you don't meet that vision, you're disappointed. Yeah. I, I tend to have no preconceived or expectations when I go out because I don't want to be disappointed. I want to find it when I'm out yeah. there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but I think the point you're making, Darren, is if you turn up at a place and you look around and you think, there's nothing here, you know, the light's exactly. crap, and it's just like, it's just, no, it's nothing. And all of a sudden you're on the back burner and you think, well, I've really got to work hard to find something. Yeah. And then by working hard, you're, you know, do you ever get anything? Well, sometimes you come some away with something but most of the time you think no, i'm just going to give this one up as a bad job it is all about getting turning up at somewhere and thinking right i'm excited now i'm going to go out i know a composition i'm going to go and take a good shot that's it i think if you're excited about being in a place then the photography can almost come second you can almost mm -hmm. think look if i don't get a photo today i don't care because i'm having such a wonderful time actually where i am but if you're not particularly inspired by the surroundings and then you're looking for a photo at the same time, for me, it can soon go downhill fairly quickly. That's a really good point. There's an epic ridge in Snowdonia called the Carnevi, which you will see very few photographs of. But if you ever stand on it, you'll be absolutely blown away. It's, it's one of those otherworldly places, but it's absolutely rubbish for photography. And mm. I've never once featured it on my channel. And I've been up there and thought, well, I'm not mm. going to bother photographing this or even filming it. And if it's I want to so, go out yeah. without any photography equipment, that's where I go. So I think Darren and Jamie were saying as well about um, being inspired. Uh, and I think sometimes, weirdly enough, that can work the other way. Because I've been to places, especially when I first started vlogging, I went to uh, Stanage Edge. And it's the first time I've been to a peak district. And I was almost too inspired and I couldn't stand still long enough to get a decent shot because like, I was just like, everything was everywhere. So you ain't got to find a bit of a, a balance, but yeah, definitely. If you go to somewhere that you're not inspired by, I think it's the measure of the photographer that if you can get a good shot when you're not inspired, then you must be doing something right. But uh, I certainly can't. So the question yeah. there is, wh why did you go there in the first place? Sure, surely you'd have been inspired by something you've seen or heard to go to that location. Um, it was just a question of finding something new. That's what I did. I just turn up, you know, whatever new and trying to find what I can, what I can get. I guess you're right. But I, I suppose that when you go, when you've got limited access to places, so there's only a certain number of places you can go to, you don't want to return to the same old, same old. Maybe you get to a point where you are just hunting for somewhere to go and you get there and it's not as inspiring as you were hoping for, perhaps. Mm. I'm not sure. But then, but then, going off everything you're saying there, and and what other people are saying, there's other facets as well. Um, it was mentioned about fine art photography, and I'm just trying to link this in. Is when you're at a place, there's there's other ways of demonstrating um, or getting uh, something that excites you. So you can ICM, multiple exposure. You could even try um, shooting something that isn't even anything at that moment in time and bring it home and apply some post-processing and, and be more and abstract you mean possibly more abstract or even just having a vision in your own mind mm. so 
you're walking around, you're, you're not satisfied where you are. You're like, oh, God, you know, shite this. I tell you what, look at that. The sun there, the way it is. I can get a starburst on that. I can take a picture of this old barn that's not in the shot and make a composite. Or just, just to bring elements together. So when you're out there, and don't, don't think that, oh, this, this, I can't get anything. I, I think we're, we're blessed. We, at any point in time, we're out with a camera. There's something we can we can do, whether it be ICM. I'm not a fan of ICM, but Andy Gray, he's kind of a, he's the man who's pushing that mantle, and he's made me look in different directions when you're struggling. You know, like at home now, we're all struggling in the back garden or what have you. And so I've been doing some ICM of clouds uh, today, just, just playing around with it. They look shite, but I might get one or two, you know. <laughs> He kind of does ICM to a whole new level, though, Andy yeah. Gray, doesn't he? Yeah. He, he isn't just move the camera up and down a bit. His is really go to town with it. And, you know, I think that I, I bet you he had an awful lot of uh, failed visits before he perfected what he does because it's very, it looks like his work's incredible, but I bet it's difficult to. I, I bet he's on a, it. Yeah, I bet he's on a 1% success rate, you know. I yeah, bet yeah. The, the amount of images he takes. Mm. But he brings it to another level. The movement he does is, I mean, what on earth is that about? Yeah. yeah. That doesn't interest yeah. me really, to be honest. Not I, me I think, neither, but I'm just saying there's a, there is other things like multiple exposures. I used to play a lot with an old Fuji film camera that would let you take a couple of, it'd rewind yeah. the film and it'd let you double expose. Overlap exposure. You didn't know yeah. what you was going to get. And it was great yeah. fun because it, it's not always about being in the place where you are taking the pictures. And I'm sure each and every one of us have got home and thought that was what a waste of time. And then got oh. I say there's a little cheesy, <laughs> a little nugget there, you know. I like that, you know. I, I think you're right about there is so many other things you can do when you're out on site, but to pick up on what Darren said initially about having the inspiration, if I rock up at a place and I've got it in my head what I'm going to be shooting and, and I turn up there and it's just nothing like it at all and you, and you can't get on. Like when we went to Southwold, through the Darren and, and Gary, and I turned up there and the sunrise was great for the first few minutes, but then I really struggled after that and I wanted to carry on taking shots, but I just struggled and all of a sudden your motivation drops because you, you I don't know, because you've not got that inspiration anymore and you're struggling then to convert yourself to thinking, well, now I'm going to go in close, I'm going to do my ICM, I'm going to do my intimate shots. But that's a mindset thing to, to yeah. convert yourself from thinking, well, my expectation was to come here and get this shot and now it's not there. So now I'm cheesed off. Now yeah. I'm going to convert myself to do different type of photography. One of the most key, one of the key elements in being a good landscape photographer is having the ability to adapt though, quickly change mm. and also keep disciplined as well. Yeah. You, you've no, got and it's all about the light, not forgetting in the day, you know, a blade of grass, how the light's touching that, and yeah. what you can form yeah. from that, creating yeah. abstract imaging, images. Yeah. You have to ask yourself, though, if getting some sort of image is an essential requirement, because there are plenty of times when I'll go out with a bag full of camera equipment and come home with nothing and go, so what, I had a lovely time. A job. Really enjoyed yeah. myself. yeah. And, and, you know, none of us have to create an image because we've got a picture editor on our backs or, you know, we've got a calendar to fill up or whatever it may be. So sometimes rather than be disappointed, you, you know, for example, Jamie, you've had the sunrise, you've had 15, 20 minutes of interesting photography. Then it's time to just sit there with your flask of coffee and watch the waves lapping on the beach. Maybe though, maybe you haven't got a wife though who says, uh, you know, what have you spent that hundred pound petrol on? I <laughs> see the pictures that you've, uh, you know, that, that you've come up, come back with for that expense. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah. I, I've got to. I'm sorry. I've really got to interrupt, but I want to be in Darren's chair right now. He looks very relaxed there. This was. That's why actually that I'm. I don't know if you noticed, I'm quite chilled actually this week. The last couple of couple of weeks, I've been a, a little bit more hyper, but. This is the the pub chair that I sat in for ten years around the pub, and I bought it off of them. and And this is how I act around the pub, just very kind of chilled. Sometimes nod off. So yeah, if I start, <laughs> if I start to, if I start to do this, you know, then I just just to uh, give us a holler. Is that from all the bird watching you've been up to last week, then, Darren? Is it just soothing you? Ah, uh, tell you what, let me tell you this story. 
I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story. <laughs> I'm well doing it. This is, this is from my, my darling wife, bless her. This is a real backhanded compliment. I was, uh, last week I was talking about kind of photographing blurry arses with all the birds. And there was a, a, a robin landed on the, on the log. So I literally just fired off a load of shots with the hope that it would it would fly away. But what happened? A pigeon actually landed on the edge end of the log at the same time as I was pressing the shutter speed. So I actually got a really nice shot of this pigeon with its wings up, but the light was coming through and, and the shadow of its wing was on its chest. So I came in and Helen said, oh, what did you get? And I said, oh, I said, I know it's not every cup of tea, everyone's cup of tea. It's only a, you know, a pigeon. And she went... Oh, she said, I really like pigeons. She went, I know they're not the most kind of graceful birds in the world. She said, but, and she was trying to use an analogy. And she said, I'd rather have like a Shrek in my life than a Prince Charming. And I went, oh, thanks very much. (laughs) (laughs) So she went, oh, no, no, I didn't didn't kind of mean it like that. So I'm really pleased that she's attracted to Shrek and not obviously a good looking bloke. What's your address again, mate? <laughs> <laughs> Don't remind me. I think we're done with it. Oh, actually, no, there was one other comment that I did want to to uh, just mention because Tony Faulkner had talked about uh, comparisons between ourselves and the inimitable photo nerds. And uh, Sir Gary of Goff was good enough to write in and say, uh, really annoying, I switched you on at midnight for a two-minute quickie. Not sure what he means by that. <laughs> Uh, to watch before bedtime and didn't end up hitting the sack until after 1am. Well, that's the effect we have on people, is it not? <laughs> we, we, we have to say we really appreciate it because, frankly, yeah. we're not even remotely trying to compete. No. We're, we're, you know, we're kind of getting into the, uh, getting towards the second half of tonight's show and we're already slipping into inco- incoherence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a whole different sort of standard to, to measure ourselves by. We actually did have a sort of loose agenda of things we might want to throw out there for discussion. And there was one that caught my eye uh, particularly because I think it, it's something that's very easy for everybody to have an opinion on. Uh, and it was, what's our favorite time for shooting? Uh, are we talking sunrise, sunset, spring, autumn, whatever? Let's just sort of go around and see, you know, what, what, what really gets us going in terms of inspiration, as we were just alluding to. Pickled eggs. Oh, oh. That's, that's right. They, they inspire you to get Dude. out of bed. Absolutely. Love you imagine the Spear smell. and pickled eggs, mate. That I'm glad I'm 200 one. miles away. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> oh. It's sunrise, anyway. For me, it's sunrise because it's, it's untouched, isn't it? The sky is untouched. It's unpollu- unpolluted. It's quiet. It's the start of the day, so you know when you've done, you've got the rest of the day to look forward to. Uh, it, it's just better light around, less crowded in comparison with sunset. For me, definitely. Sunrise. I think there's something really nice about driving up to somewhere in, in the, the dark. dark. Yeah, and then getting there, setting up, and just waiting for the whole world to sort of just come to life. Yeah. So I agree with you, mate. Sunrise, 100% for me, definitely. What about seasons? Mm. Autumn for me, mm. definitely autumn. Autumn and winter, to be honest, because when I'm in the fells, you get a lot of moodiness, a lot of uh, different weather conditions. Uh, in addition, to obviously, the Lakeland colours in the autumn, and again, the light, the low angle light. So autumn leading to winter for me. Um, summer, no. Nah. Don't like summer. It's good for hiking, but not for uh, photography. It's funny. I used to, I was looking at a clip that was um, two or three years ago when it was a photo show and, and Julian Baird and, and um, uh, Chris Sale did a, a, a quick sort of interview with me on that uh, thing. And they asked me the question, sunset or sunrise? And I said sunset at the time. And that's because I was out a lot shooting sunsets and I hadn't really got heavily into sunrises. But since I've started to get out for sunrises, there's no going back, really. No. You know, I, I think you're right. Sunrises are just so, just to stand there and watch the sun come up and the light that you get, but just the experience more than anything else. So just being there before anybody else has, has, has been there and just experienced that light. It's just fantastic. So I think definitely sunrises for me. Yeah, no, 99% of my 
my uh, videos or, or, or my photos, they all come at sunrise. Hardly mm. any. I, I can probably count on number on one hand of sunsets that I've actually taken. Everything for me is is sunrise. Mm. So that will obviously become a lot harder then, Darren, as we approach spring, uh, May, June time when the sun rises about four to five in the morning, and you need to be on location that time. Unless obviously you've got the advantage of a camper van, aren't you? Well, yeah, I, I do. Um... But I, you know, as I said, I know that I've only been shooting the wildlife for a, a few weeks, but I, I'm really going to pursue this. And I think the, the beauty with shooting the wildlife is that I think I am going to be inspired by my local area for the first time ever, really, because you're right. For me, I have to normally kind of travel to the coast, Norfolk or Suffolk. That's the closest place to me that I generally shoot. And when you come to the summer months, yeah, sometimes my alarm is going off at kind of one o'clock in the morning yeah. for me to get up and get ready and then get down there. Uh, but but now, I think, you know, there's so many nature reserves around here and you've got the local river as well. Now, I can obviously just roll out of bed and places I can actually walk to now. So mm. I, I think for, for me, nothing's really going to change. I'll still be getting up at sunrise, just hopefully the locations will be a lot closer to home now. Mm. Mm. There's something wonderful about January, all through January, the light never goes too high and you get the sunrise, you can get the sunset. I just love that time of year. You get the burners of the trees, you get silhouettes, you get, it's a lovely time of year. Why well, just January? Surely that's November, December, January. Yeah, well, November. Yeah. But, but there's something after Winter, Christmas. Summer, there's something it's... after Christmas. You know, you've, you're not you're not focused Christmas and all this, but you're coming out of Christmas and the new year's starting and you go out and it's fresh and there's something quite naked about the environment. You've got this low light and shadows and it, it's just beautiful. And if you get a bit of weather thrown in that as well, so you've got all these shadows, strong light piercing, and all of January, yeah, February, but there's something about the new year, the start of a new year, and new projects, new ideas, and a, a thirst for photography. I just love that time of year. I was going to say that as well, actually, that I we, we try to go to Wales uh, sort of every February in the half term, and that's my favourite time year because a well i guess i'm associating it with going to wales which i really enjoy but b you get those generally like mally was saying the light's quite sort of it's quite low most of the day but you get that odd little bit towards the end of february where it's very much you start to get sometimes get that feeling of spring and you know you you'll get the odd sort of really strange day and i that, i really like that time of year so i i think Late February coming into March is probably my favourite time yeah, of photographs. Yeah. Fogs and mists as well. Yeah. You, you start building up the atmosphere and you can feel the air is changing, the, the world around you is changing and it's about to... Don't get me wrong, spring's lovely, but, you know, there's something about that time of year, Gary, like you said. The window after winter's ending and spring's beginning. Yeah. 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 I, I'm completely at odds with all of these um, not because I disagree with you at all I, you all you're all absolutely spot on right however you're wrong <laughs> no 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 not, not at all it's just personal preference but but it's it's a complete paradox because my favorite thing to do is be on the beach any time between May and September because I'm usually in a t-shirt and it's, you know, I live on a western facing coast, so the sunsets can be pretty spectacular. Yeah. Also, yeah. they go on for a long time. The, the advantage of sunset over sunrise is that the, the golden hour light and then the blue hour light, you get a good two, two and a half, three hours, sometimes midsummer of photography. So it's not that because, you know, sunrise can be all over in, in a flash. That said, most, that's what I enjoy the most. So I'm still by a tripod, I'm having the best time, but. I'm getting by far the best images at sunrise. 
Um, but those images are where I crawl out of a tent about three thirty, four o'clock in the morning. So I'm not driving to a location. I'm not climbing a mountain in the dark. With, yeah, with tepid, tent. tepid weather as well. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, rolling out of a tent and brewing up a cup of coffee. I've, you know, I've done that with Darren. He, he'll attest to this, except for the fact we couldn't see anything. Um, but but when when you roll out of a tent and the sun is just peeping up over a ridge and you've got that little sliver of sunlight in the mist and you've got the colour and the high cloud just above a mountain ridge, epic, just just absolutely epic. But every time, where would you prefer? I prefer it to be on the beach in a t-shirt. With, with no chance of a decent image, but I'm having a better time because I'm warm and happy. I think as well, I don't know if I've ever said this on, on the podcast, but regardless of um, photography, I'm just a, a very much a morning person. You know, I, I lo- when I go to the lakes, which is about seven, well, about eight hours actually in the motorhome because it is a bit of a beast to, to, to drive, but I think nothing of setting off at midnight, one o'clock in the morning from say Cambridge in the dark and then driving towards the lake, but you're driving into daylight. I really enjoy driving though. It sounds odd. It maybe sound a bit weird, but driving somewhere in the dark with my music on and that's part of the fun. That's part of the fun for me. That's, you know, cause because I've got, have to travel so far to get to anywhere. I guess you've got to like the driving, but I love it. I love it. Yeah. Love but are you talking yeah. driving in the morning or are you talking about driving of a night? No, driving in the morning, setting that's off what at I mean. sort of 2 a.m. Yeah. No, nothing on the roads. You know, oh, yeah. you know, you're in your own little world, you've got your music on, you're heading off to somewhere, you know you're going to have a good day. I love it. Just really enjoy it. Here, I've got a question for you all. Has any of you like, had your prostate checked? <laughs> oh! <laughs> no, no, it's what? A, it's mean, a, what? It's a serious question. Do you mean offici- officially or? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. With some bishop's finger in it. Is it, is it a photography question? No, yeah. I just, I just, you know, I'm just cut, I'm getting to I that. have, yes, I have. I'll have tell you. you the scariest thing. You need to stay on the cold. I wasn't expecting it. I, what the? What do you mean you wasn't expecting it? What was you expecting? Okay, no, sorry. <laughs> what, did you just go for some fish and chips or something? <laughs> <laughs> Harry's going to have a nightmare explain. I went for another let's say another procedure right. and the first test of that was the old I'm <laughs> sorry but this is not going on my channel yeah of course it is. <laughs> we have to we have to talk about men's health you know wrong with it. okay so it, the procedure wasn't intended for the prostate check it was something else um, coloroscopy or something yeah oh, right. yeah so I had a bit of uh, pain in my stomach, and the first procedure was just bend over, and I wasn't expecting it. On rubber gloves, I should have known. And it was like, whoa! I've never had that before. What the? What on earth's going on here? How long? How long did it last for? What? <laughs> well, the actual like two <laughs> seconds. Enough. <laughs> Long time in it. Not again, so I can record it. Right. Okay. No, I just, I just kind of wondered if you guys, I, I should get it done. I do think that when I come out of lockdown, I think I, I should. See, now that wasn't on the running order for tonight. <laughs> it wasn't. Darren's version of a loose agenda is completely off the scale. I thought we was getting far too formal. Let's bring it, let's bring it back to blokes down the pub. I was going to say, there's a lot of things that I've got booked in for as soon as we come out of lockdown. And that isn't one of them. It's man. not one of them. I'll be honest Think with you. Think MOT's going first. <laughs> Got it. You need to. That that's that should be on your list. That, what, that, oh, lockdown's over. Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Get the rubber gloves. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take this offline, Darren? Yeah. Are we not doing the pub quiz, by the way? Oh, oh yeah. yes. Well, I was about to come on to that. All right. Hey, do, you, do you want to do the pub, do you want to do the pub we, quiz? Yeah. 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 Come yes. on. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. You know? So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you ever so much for sticking with us this far, if you have. <laughs> and if you have, don't forget to get checked. <laughs> Absolutely. As long as, long as you're of the male persuasion. We're now going over to Darren, who's our pub quiz master for tonight's pub quiz. Well, this was the uh, the first the first pub quiz that I printed off, so apologies if it's a bit pants. But anyway, we'll, I've, got, I've got 10 to 15 questions. Let's go for 10. Have you, got 10, have you got age five to ten? Yeah, you there is a question that you're you're quite like actually. Right, okay. Cool. Outside which New York building was John Lennon killed? 
Oh. Ooh. I thought it was his house. No, it was. I thought he uh, was oh, going in the night in his door and he got shot in the back. He got shot in the entrance of a hotel because of what was going on with him in America and him being this big voice and he wasn't allowed to come home. They locked him away in a in a room in a hotel with Yoko Ono and there was an entrance to this hotel. I still don't know the an answer that. <laughs> you were sounding uh, good for a minute. What about the, what, what about the, uh, the, the Astoria or the Waldorf or something? Oh, like that's that? a good shout. Plaza. So is that what Waldorf? Is what, that is plaza? Your answer? what is your answer? Waldorf. We don't know. Waldorf salad. You're going with the Waldorf. Is it Grand Grand Central Station? Well, I can only I can only take one answer. What is it? What we're going to go? The Belmont. Boys. It was the Belmont. You're going with the Belmont. Why not? I can tell you, you was all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer was the Dakota Building. Oh yeah. Of course it was. Yeah. Did they get any easier? Hmm. Yes, they do. Well, I thought that was quite an easy one, to be I, honest with you. I, I can tell you who shot one. him. I honestly... What year was it? 1980, and it was Mark Chapman who shot him. No, yeah. it was 81, wasn't it? Was it? it could be no. 81. 80. Was it 80? Siri, when was John Lennon you shot get, you... and were? <laughs> <laughs> Who the bloody hell do I know? <laughs> Right, okay. Oh, Yorkshire on. Siri. I gotta get me a Yorkshire Siri. <laughs> you silly bugger. Carry on. Which Next. character does Morgan Freeman play in Bruce Almighty? God. 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 Correct. Easy. Complete the advertising slogan for FedEx when there is no lockdown, then you will get your parcel. <laughs> I don't know. No idea. FedEx no, is more American. When there's no excuses. When there's no excuses. Is mm. that what you're going for? No excuses? Mm. No, it's, 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 worth, it's worth a guess, but you was wrong. The <laughs> the answer is tomorrow. When there is no tomorrow. Oh. Mm-hmm. Wellington is the capital of which country? New Zealand. New Zealand. New Zealand. Correct. Right now. I won't know if you guys are cheating, but the people at home will know if you're cheating because they will see you look down. So eyes directly on me for this, please. Eyes on me. Which what? Which letter is located between letters X and V on a standard keyboard? C. C. Well done. Well Let's done, go. gentlemen. Hell. Ah, uh, this one's far too easy. Yeah, this is one's for you, James. Which famous astronaut once said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind? Where did you get these questions from? Not for me. Well, no, because you were the one earlier. You said they get easier. Well, Collins was left upstairs, wasn't he? He was. So come on, I'll narrow that down for you. Was it Buzz Aldrin? Regarding? <laughs> <laughs> no, he was the one who circled around, wasn't he? Like of the dog. <laughs> right, you're playing with me now. What is your answer? Was, otherwise, I'm going to go for like of the dog. Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong. Neil there Armstrong. we go. You've got geography questions. questions. This is a good one, actually. Right. In the opening lyrics to Queen's Killer Queen, what does she keep in her pretty cabinet? Maria Shondon. Well done. Oh, oh, God. Okay. I like a bit of Queen. Yeah, Gary, me too. Gary, Gary, okay. Gary. Like how many of how many of Snow White's seven dwarfs have names ending in the letter Y? Three. Six. Sneezy. Dopey. It's not Doc. Mally. <laughs> <laughs> Mally with a Y. <laughs> it ends in I. Come on. Uh, it's five, isn't it? Bashful. Bashful. Three. Bashful and Bashful. <laughs> no, Bashful. Oh, Bashful. Bashful and Doc. Bashful. That's a Three reindeer and it has an L. Effeminate. Yeah. That's your answer. What's the answer? Is it three? <laughs> right, what, no, what is your answer? I think it's five. Five. Gary's saying five. I'm saying three. I'm losing so many subscribers. <laughs> right. You go, don't worry about your subscribers. We're down the pub. Right. So we, what are you going for? Three or five? <laughs> three. Three gone him. Should have listened to Gary. Five, innit? Right with five. Oh. 
Well, we know what Gary watches then, don't we, in an evening? As of 2018, which athlete had won the most Olympic medals? Steve Redgrave? Mm, Michael Phelps. Yeah. Not athlete. Well no. done. Um, yeah, Phelps. Oh, is he yeah, classed as an athlete? Phelps. <laughs> No, I mean, like, are you talking about like runners or? Yeah, really, yeah, track and field or? I think he's given it, Phelps. He's given us the nod. Well, I, I kind of said, yeah, well done. And then oh, we carried yeah, on yeah, debating. Yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. we'll just go with well it. done, Gary. So, yeah. Okay, right. The last question is, and it's an alcohol question. Oh, God, are then. The two main ingredients of a screwdriver cocktail. Orange. Vodka and orange juice. Well yeah. done, that man. Well done. I watch Faulty Towers. So, one, ah, two, seven three, dwarfs. four, five, six, seven. You won seven, three, gentlemen. Well, that's a feature that we won't be bringing back in. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. That was it lasted. <laughs> Uh, you, Dave, you seem very nervous about what's happening tonight because it's going on your channel. Yeah, I, I think the upload might the upload might fail. It's just a just guys in a pub. <laughs> yes, that's the problem. Hey, knowing David though, the way he is with his channel, he'd probably pick up another six thousand. So, the any, anybody got any other business to to throw in as we're getting towards wrap up time? Oh no, we've got plenty of time left. Yeah, I've cut out about. Three and quarters of an hour already. Are you editing um, live? So, yeah, because this just, is what's I'm, happening. I'm just work, it's all going on in the head now. I'm only joking. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you what we could talk about. There was a really good question from uh, the same guy whose wife um, works in the NHS. You know the one. Oh, Bert. 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 Jake. Yeah. He asked a question about have any of us ever got a shot straight out of the camera, essentially, that we haven't needed to do anything with at all in Lightroom. But I think that's a really good question because I yeah. think that will lead on nicely to talk about editing and the importance of it in my Okay, opinion. yeah, let's do it. Okay, so I'm sure I always shoot RAW. As we all know, RAW is a digital negative at the end of the day, so it's there purposefully for editing, no matter what. You need to add a bit of contrast, a bit of saturation. Um, I think the argument there spills on to the purist side of it, how far do you go? Me personally, I still like to keep it natural uh, to what was in front of me at the time but mm -hmm. a raw file is just a flat file it's like a negative so well, it does on, need some form of editing of course going, it does going on to what you're saying there james and i've never done this in all the time i've been shooting but lately i'm shooting raw and jpeg why <gasps> I've why? Never done it. Why? What's the purpose? Why? No, 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 no. A no, landscape. No. Yes, I can so understand if you're doing a bit of journalism and you've got to get that image quickly well, to produce and things like that, or the magazine. But well, it's, da it's Darren's fault. I'll tell you why. It's Darren's fault. He set up this wonderful hide on his vlog and he's done the bird birding, bit of tweet, bit of what, 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 what we call it? Uh, bit, bit of birding. Bit of birding, bit, bit of birding. birding. And so I set my camera to shoot both because I was interested to see what my camera was doing that I, you know, what I do, what does the camera do? Forget it. Shoot What raw. do you mean by that? Shoot what raw. You mean, you mean... Because if you shoot... Oh, you didn't you like shoot, the JPEGs? You, no, yeah. no, not at all. I didn't like exactly. the JPEGs one bit. The, the, the way the camera, it can't think for you. It can't see depth. It can't see contrast. It can't see what you see, which brings me back to what you said, James, is that you, you, the raw file is up to you to try and interpret what you saw in front of you. But when you're birding and you're shooting your wildlife, it, it's so quick. I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll set it to JPEG because I'm going to have a lot of images to process. I don't understand the purpose of JPEGs because whichever camera you have, you have a series of settings that affect how the JPEG is, is created in camera. You've got a boffin in a lab who's going, this is what my camera will do with your raw file and present it to you. And if you go vivid or portrait or landscape or cityscape or whatever, we'll punch this up or punch that down or whatever it may be. The fact remains, it'll be absolutely rubbish. And uh, 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 no, 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 I'm going to finish my sentence. Finish. Any decent photographer will want to be able to completely control everything 
that they then subsequently present to their audience. And if you go, oh, here's a JPEG, it's an utterly pointless exercise. Right. So that brings me back to the point about shooting birds. Mm. About the fact that within that dynamic range, what do you actually need to shoot birds? Now, I don't. I agree with you completely, David. I always shoot raw, but I've tried it with the JPEGs, and for for speed. So, for instance, if you're gonna go out and you're gonna shoot something that's fast moving, fast paced, and you need to get them pictures edited in out quick. I, I yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. For yeah. quickness purpose, absolutely. Yeah. And it's hard yeah, to do if you're with behind the goal as well, at Wembley. If, if you're a guy with a 600mm lens behind a goal at Wembley and your newspaper is expecting your photograph to be uploaded via Wi-Fi within 30 seconds of some overpaid bozo heading the ball into the top corner, okay, then yes, <laughs> JPEG, that's where you've got a JPEG. But if you're, if you're a photographer and you're an artist... JPEGs have no interest to you whatsoever. Well, there's another reason you shoot JPEG, though, and I can see why uh, Mally might shoot it for birds, is because you can buffer more. Or you can take more shots before the buffer runs out. So oh. if you're, yeah, so if you're shooting um, fast-moving things and you're trying to get as many shots in as you can, if you're shooting raw, your buffer will run out quicker, so you might miss that shot, whereas with JPEG, you're not going to miss it. Buy an think, Olympus or oh, EM1 and you get <laughs> 60 frames a second raw. Yeah but, it, yeah, but it depends. You get 60 frames, but it doesn't write to the card unless you want to invest in a really high-quality, expensive card. Yeah, Fair XQD, enough. yeah. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. I mean, that's what that's what I've been, uh, the trouble I've been having, like, you know, recently, because I think I can take about, I can take about 80 frames before the buffer fills up. Wow. But then it takes about 30 seconds, 35 seconds, to actually then write them to my cards, which are a fairly slow card, because I've never invested in top quality, high speed cards, because landscape photography, you don't really need it. Yeah. So like you, Mally, I've been trying to capture birds in flight. So when a robin, because they're like the best ones for me, the blue tits are just too fast for the, for the area uh, uh, frame that I've got. So the robins are a bit slower. So I wait for them to sit on the perch and I'm thinking, do I press it now? Do I press it now? And then I'll, I'll press it and it's like, bah, 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 and it's firing away. And it's, I can see it, it's still there. And I'm thinking, please fly away. And then it buffers. <laughs> and then within a second, it flies off. So yeah. I do, th and when I'm processing these photos, they take minutes to, pro well, I found that my wildlife takes minutes, whereas a landscape photo can take ages to, to, to process so it, it might be worth considering actually shooting jpeg and raw for that instance so going back to the original question um it, does it all depend on what sort of genre of photography you take yeah. is that what we say yeah it? yeah definitely yeah. 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 yeah yeah but regards to what level of editing do you do i mean the question is have you ever produced the end result purely from a raw file and then convert to a jpeg they nothing whatsoever even with jpeg there is some editing we know but has anyone done that? I've never done that, but I have, I would probably say the best shot I've, that I feel I've ever taken was probably the one that took the least amount of editing from me. So maybe there's something to be said that when you get it spot on in camera, that that's almost, you know, the more yeah. processing you have to do, probably the, the, the less of the shot is in the first place. Yeah. It gets to a point where the more yeah, editing is a question that you're actually covering up, covering up any faults of the original image. Mm. Yeah, but it's it's interesting when you start to use Lightroom and Photoshop to that extent, but primarily Lightroom as a as a new entrant to Lightroom. If you're a landscape photographer, all of a sudden you've got so much opportunity to change that picture. And you know, I've seen it, and I'm sure we all have pictures posted up that have just been either oversaturated, too much clarity and the rest of it. And it's just one of those early hurdles that I think a lot of people fall into or fall yeah. over when you've got a picture and you think, blimey, it looks so much different if I just boost the clarity or boost the vibrance. And I love that. No, you don't. It looks rubbish, you know, but, you know, you think you love it because all of a sudden you find out you can do something to that picture that you never thought you could. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I, I look after and I help with a, a learning group um, at camera learning group and a lot of the people in there are a sort of entrance into Lightroom and entrance into you know learning what they can do to their pictures and it's really encouraging to see people actually listening to 
when you're saying just be careful with those sliders don't push those sliders just treat them very gently because any slight over touch with the saturation and things like that can just ruin a picture and how many times do we see it on social media a picture that gets loads of likes because it's just far too saturated yeah on instagram yeah. Yeah, on I still get accused now of, of overdoing some of my work. Uh, Ian, who we were talking about earlier, he sometimes says, I think you've done too much to that, which actually I really like that. I like that as a comment. You know, I appreciate yeah. it. But someone said to me once, um, or I, I read somewhere or I saw on YouTube once, and there's a brilliant piece of advice is that do your edits, walk away, come back to it the next day, and just knock it all back by about 30%. And that's probably where you want to be. Because you all, when you edit first off, you always go over. You always do more than you think you need. Yeah. It's mm. quite interesting that though, Gary, because because we're all locked in and we're all not out like we should be. I've done the complete opposite. Yeah. So I would normally do what you're saying. You'd edit, I'd go away, come back the next day, and I'd relook at my images and I'd drop it back a bit and think, you know, you're being, you know, that acid you had last night was a bit strong. <laughs> so, but, so what we'll do is we'll we'll have another look at it, but then. Uh, looking back at photographs lately, I posted an image today, reflections at Carmel Dam, and, and I boosted the saturation, and I boosted the clarity, just just a, a touch. I brought out the clouds and brought out the water and the reflections. And I look at it and I think, am I being critical to myself to a degree where I'm possibly missing out on what is just about right? It's not too hot, it's not too cold. You know, the Goldilocks of photography could sometimes be at a point where you come back to an image a year later and it does need boosting. It does need saturation. It does need to be given that plinth, that place of, like, grandeur. I think think it all goes back to doing it for yourself, doing editing for yourself, editing something you like. I see loads of pictures, especially if you go on Twitter. There's some amazing photographers on Twitter absolutely fantastic but a lot of photographs from the landscape point of view now all seem to follow the exact same formula a sort of triangular sort of piece of foreground interest shot quite high down onto you know onto that foreground looking over to the background and they all have that sort of formula and there's nothing wrong with that but what i'm saying is is that if everyone shoots the same and if everyone processes the same then we're going to have an awful lot of very similar pictures all knocking about. I think mm. that I'm quite reserved when it comes to processing my images. I I look at them and I think, oh, perhaps I have kind of overdone that a little bit. And I do actually reduce the saturation. Uh, and the, I, don't, I don't play around with the, with the vibrance too much, but I do sometimes reduce the saturation. And I'll, I'll post it and I'm really happy with the image. However... I sometimes see your images, Mally, which sometimes are quite saturated. And I look at them and I just think, that is an incredible image. I absolutely love the way you've processed that. But when I do it, I just feel uncomfortable. But when I see other people do it, I just think, brilliant image. It's like like tickling trout, though, isn't it, Darren? You've got to just tickle that trout, right? If you you give it too much... (laughs) Is that a euphemism? <laughs> what do you mean, tickle the trail? Seriously, it's, it's, if you give something, it, it's just about balance. I, I am not an over... So you've mentioned about saturation, and I'm always fighting to not saturate too much because I feel it's unnatural. But there are moments when I think I haven't given it enough. That image is too dark, it's too sullen. It's too so it, it's horses for courses, isn't it? You know, yeah. you want to create the emotion, don't you? You want yeah. to replicate that motion that yeah. you've gone through at that moment in time. But it, it, the, the key yeah. here is subtlety, isn't it? Which then begs begs the, begs the question: Why is there such option to play around? Why why is the range so high? Mm. The key component, most important part, is subtlety. Yeah. At the end of the yeah. day, yeah. Um, yeah. I know. Everybody creates their own style as well. I think if we all look at each other's pictures, we'll probably recognise them because yeah. of the way they're edited. Because everybody edits in a certain way. And you know, yeah. Darren, you say you sort of undersaturate Mally, maybe slightly over to get the right mood. 
James is a very moody pictures and the way you edit, you know, the same with Dave, you can see some of your stuff. Everybody can see a style and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's good that you've got your own style because it is so subjective, isn't it? Everybody edits in a different way. They've got a different feeling when they edit. And if we're all the same, then as Gary said, you'd see completely the same images all the time. And that brings us back to the original premise of, what's the function of jpegs the fact remains that in order for us all to express ourselves we really need raw files yes mm, absolutely yes. yeah yeah as yeah. landscape photographers or a photo landscape photographer i'd never ever shoot jpeg uh, but i can just see that uh, what i was saying was just see the point if you're trying to get a lot of shots onto the onto the card quickly but but yeah i mean going back to what you were saying darren though you were saying that you you don't oversaturate or you don't saturate as much as you think you should why is that is that because you're worried about how other people will perceive your image or is that because when you're saying you look at malice and you really like it why don't you do yours do you see what i mean no i i, I, I do I, it's, it's a it's a fair point but i just think i look at yeah i think perhaps there is uh a part of me that worries what other people will think. And I think if we all said, oh, well, we shouldn't worry about other people, then I think we're perhaps not being true because I think mm -hmm. we all like people to appreciate our photos. Yeah. So we yeah. do it for ourselves, but I think we also do it for others as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when I, when I look at an image, you know, I do, I, I'm not, I'm quite a reserved person. I'm quite a conservative person, really. So I don't really... I don't really push my sliders that much. I get it to a point where I think it looks natural and I think it looks realistic. But then when I see other people's images, not everybody's, because I mean, you see so many oversaturated images that look false, fake, as you say, James, HDR. But there is some striking sunrises or sunsets where it has been uh, boosted with a saturation and they just look fantastic. I absolutely love them. Are you concerned? So, are you concerned then, Darren, that you're actually going out of your comfort zone? You're coming away from the brand which you believe you've created. Yeah, I, I are think you're copying so. someone else. Is that your main concern? I just think, I think, in the back of my mind, I suppose I'm a bit worried about. Not, not I am concerned about what other people think, but I suppose even myself, I'm just thinking. Did I see that sunrise as bright as that? Was that, you know, was that was that sky really as, as, as vivid as that? And then I think I'll start to have these little doubts in my mind that, mm. no, let's just keep it realistic, you know, rather than... Yeah, but the other thing to consider is we are creating a piece of artwork, effectively, unless it's, unless it's a snapshot yeah. that we're taking and a record shot, then it needs to be natural. But at the end of the day, we've got artistic license. Okay, I, to I totally agree with you. Totally That's what fine art photography is all about, chaps. Well. The, the, yeah, yeah. There's, some, there's something else, though, that we're, we're missing on here. We're talking about saturation. We're talking about, like, adding clarity. With, the, the, there's a thing I've been really struggling with, and I've struggled with it for years, and that's punch, pushing through. Mm. making that image balance between clarity between sharpness between defined areas david is very good in photoshop at creating defined areas and punch without saturation there's there's a you key mean, point for me where you can create an image and it's about the push on the screen it, it almost comes out at you on the screen yeah, yeah. and that's not involving all about saturation or it's all about clarity or pushing sliders i, I find yeah it's this, yeah, it's good you point, know, though. yeah. Do, do i know find what I mean? that i what i tend to do now with most of the images under expose the image and then i focus on what areas of the image i want the viewer to focus on yeah. so local adjustments mm. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 definitely. That's the way forward for me. It Which is, we're yeah. going, we're going into luminosity masks. There, oh, it's well, never not necessarily. It's all about radial filters and gradient filters. Yeah, radial like filters. Yeah. Can, can just highlight elements of the area uh, of the image to draw your eye up to where you want the viewer to look at. Yeah. Right? Before we go, and I haven't, we, I know in previous podcasts we've done the old shout out for the NHS and the clap for the NHS, but I'm sure you've all seen Captain Tom oh, walking around. He's, yes. He's, yeah, that, to be fair, what a guy. Can what I just guy. can I just say though, I totally agree with you, Jamie, one hundred percent. However, I think it's a bit patronizing that people use his Christian name because back in the day, if some 
NCO had pitched up and said hello. And by the by the way, when he was in the forces, he was a major because you yeah. drop by one rank when you retire. So you didn't pitch up and say, "Ground control to Major Tom," did you? <laughs> it, it was Major Moore, and and I just oh, think okay. the way no no not Captain not Moore. you mate, but the way the general media have gone. Oh, yeah. look at Captain Tom going up and down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fair patronizing. Point. People assume that because you're old, you're some kind of doddery git that, you know, oh, you're yeah. suddenly pitched up with something we can make a human interest story out of. But mm. this this chap was doing stuff that the likes of us wouldn't have contemplated doing back in the day. Yeah. And but, yeah. but you're right. What an amazing man. What an amazing yeah, man. Yeah, and I just thought he deserved a bit of recognition on yeah, the podcast. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Someone yeah. else, actually, who I want to mention hasn't raised any money, but um, many friends to many of us, uh, Mike Goodwin, yeah. uh, he, him and his wife are exhibiting symptoms of coronavirus. Yeah. So oh, I hope they're really? I hope they're over it now. But I just want to you know send best wishes to you, Mike, because uh, definitely, absolutely, definitely. absolutely. Yeah. best Get wishes, well, Mike. I, I yeah. was I was privileged to spend time with them last year, and they couldn't have been more hospitable. Wonderful mm. people. Well, thank you ever so much for watching this week's podcast. We really hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have, why not subscribe to any of these other five guys' channels and join us next time? Cheers. Cheers. See ya. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>